So a few weeks ago, you might remember that I mentioned that while I was on vacation, that the Republican vice presidential candidate was, who was selected has my same last name, <laughs> which is sort of weird. Um, and now, as of this week, the Democrats have a vice presidential candidate who has my same first name, which means that Tim is running against Vance and Vance is running against Tim. It also means that until November, at least, I will have both Democrats and Republicans using my name in vain. <laughs> I'm already hearing my names used together with words like dangerous, weird, boring, incompetent, radical, creepy, a clown, a liar, a hypocrite. Obviously, none of this is actually about me, but if I look like I'm feeling not so great about myself between now and November, it might be because of all of this. I mean, I'm sort of joking, but also not really joking, because whether we like it or not, we are impacted by all the noise, by all the politics, all the constant conflict that seems to be a part of our world. So don't be surprised if you start to feel a little bit down, too, between now and November. Daniel chapter 10 begins with Daniel being depressed and in mourning for three weeks. He's not eating, he's not bathing, he's not shaving. And like me, it's connected to his name and to the political realities of his day. So verse one tells us that it's the third year of King Cyrus of Persia, which means that Babylon, the empire that destroyed Jerusalem and took David captive along with his people, has fallen. But empires are still empires, and Daniel is still being called, not Daniel, but Belteshazzar, which is the Babylonian name that was forced upon him as a way of erasing his Jewish identity. So the mention of his Babylonian name in this chapter means that he is still not free. And as he is weighed down by everything that's happening around him, he receives a message from God about a great battle or conflict or, or cosmic or spiritual conflict. As an example, Daniel encounters an angel or a divine being of some type who is terrifying. Starting in verse 5, I looked up and to my surprise I saw a man dressed in linen with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body was like topaz, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of polished bronze, and his voice like the roar of a huge choir. But this impressive, powerful, warrior-like angel said to Daniel in verse 12, when you started praying 21 days ago, your words were heard and I was sent to you. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes or angels, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Then in verse 20, he says, soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia, and then when I go, the prince of Greece will come. Okay, clear enough? <laughs> so in the ancient world, people believed, as I do actually, that the physical world and the spiritual world were connected. The way that they imagined this was when they looked up at the sky, at the stars in the sky, they imagined that the stars were gods or angels who represented the different nations of the earth, like the prince or angel of Persia or Babylon or Greece or whatever. So this cosmic gathering of, of stars was called the divine council. So in Psalm 82, the Darnell just read, we see that these spiritual representatives were supposed to guide each nation in the way of God's love and justice. But instead, they rebelled and are now resisting what God is doing in the world, which is why it took this powerful warrior angel 21 days to respond to Daniel because he was caught up in this struggle or this battle 
with a fallen angel who represented the Persian Empire. But we might think, I mean, we might have a lot of thoughts about this, but, but can't God just show up? Can't God just go wherever he wants, whenever he wants? Can't God speak to us when God wants to speak to us? Can God really be delayed? Well, let's think about it this way. Historically, one of the ways that humans believed that they heard from God was through special people, like priests and prophets and even pastors. So we look to people like me, believing that I am the voice of God in your life. So, am I? <laughs> well, I mean, you didn't answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, no. I mean, I'm a regular person just like the rest of you who gets it right sometimes and often gets it wrong. Plus, being the voice of God is way too much power. I once had a conversation with a friend who's from a, another country, and in that country, the majority of the Christians tend to view their pastors as unquestionably the voice of God. And so, so he said to me, sort of jokingly but not jokingly, Tim, if you were a pastor in my country, you could have your own jet. I mean, they didn't offer me that here, right? So clearly, I am not the voice of God, and it's not good to believe that anyone is the voice of God. But at the same time, yeah, I, I sort of hope that God can speak through me in meaningful ways as I, you know, as a pastor, invite all of us to be more reflective about life and faith and what's, what's happening around us. I hope that something meaningful happens as we try to create space for worship and for community and service. So, I mean, you guys are all here on Sunday morning, so in some way you must believe that coming to church and listening to a sermon is one of the ways of hearing a message from God. So let me tell you a little bit about what it takes for a message to arrive here on Sunday morning. First of all, some pastors are very organized in the way that they craft a sermon. They know where they're going almost from the very beginning. They know how they're going to get there using a clear plan and an organized structure. Presbyterians are famous for things like three-point sermons. I'm sure you've heard of this. A three-point sermon basically is first, you start by telling everyone what you're going to say. I'm going to say these three things. And next, you tell everybody what you're going to say. You say those three things. And then last, you close by telling people what you just said. I just said three things. So you have three points that are repeated three times. Now, I used to think that this was the only way you were supposed to do it. This was how I was supposed to do it. But I'm honestly not that organized. And I never really knew where I was going from the beginning. And to be honest, I, I got really bored of three-point sermons. And you don't want a pastor who's bored by the things that he's saying or she's saying. So my wife has been telling me from probably the beginning of our marriage, that she thinks I have attention deficit disorder. <laughs> but, but every time that she would talk to me about this, I'd say something like, do you think that Hawaiian pizza is actually pizza? Or did you know that there's a huge argument about whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie? Like you've... So yeah, I didn't think that I had ADHD. But as it turns out, I do. So. No wonder I had a hard time with three-point sermons. So instead, what I've discovered more recently is that I'm better off writing sermons less like an engineer and more like a lost traveler, <laughs> wandering around and figuring out where I'm going along the way. I just need a place to start, and then maybe I'll, I'll find something along the way. So early in the week, I read the chapter of the Bible that I'm going to talk about here on Sunday. 
And I also read some research and some, some books and articles from different theologians and Bible nerds who know a lot more about some of this stuff than I do. And the whole time that I'm doing this, I'm trying to pay attention to the words and the images and the ideas that stand out to me as strange or meaningful or interesting or confusing. At the same time, I'm trying to sort of follow where my brain might go in the midst of all of this, to all of the different stories and ideas and things that sort of might seem distracting. And I used to try to resist this as much as possible, like to focus on like what I'm supposed to focus on. But as a lost traveler, like... I don't need to resist that anymore. Like, who knows what street or path or direction might lead to the most interesting discovery, right? So here's a small sample of the thoughts that I had in a short period of time while I was working on this sermon this week. Um, This is maybe like, I don't know, five to ten minutes as I was reading the chapter. Uh, So I'd go from, and this is typical, first... um, should I have another cup of coffee? Like, that's probably like the first thought that I normally have. And then I'd go from there to, this sounds like several other stories in the Bible, Ezekiel and the story of Paul, to something that someone said on Love is Blind UK, which my wife and I have been watching this week, to Daniel seems depressed, to politics, to the things that drive me crazy about politics, to the people who drive me crazy, to I probably should get something to eat. To Belteshazzar is Daniel's Babylonian name, but we're in Persia. Why? To an art piece a friend created a few years ago. To why I gave our cat a middle name. To is Die Hard a Christmas movie? I think it is. To Michelangelo viewing his artistic process as one of discovery. Was that Michelangelo? To how does God speak? To I wonder if I can ask AI to create a list of all the terrible things people are saying about the presidential candidates to, oh, Google refuses to answer questions about politics. Can you believe that? That's interesting. To what is the divine counsel? So like all the stars in the sky, I now have all of these ideas, stories, images, insights, and questions that are somewhat connected to Daniel chapter 10. The message, the meaning, the connection to real life, the best way to explain all of this is there somewhere. But it's all too much, and now I'm exhausted, so I go home. The the next day, I start writing with all these ideas swirling around in my mind. Um, And with this writing comes a new struggle, a new battle between my inner writer and my inner editor. So I write and I erase. I write and I erase. I write and I feel like I'm getting somewhere, then I notice that I misspelled a word. And truthfully, in this very spot, the word that I misspelled was misspelled (laughs) with one S, and apparently it's supposed to be two. Then all of a sudden, my inner critic shows up who says, this part is boring. This makes no sense. Do you really think people in church want to hear about all of this? But as irritating as my inner critic can be, I need that voice to challenge some of the unfiltered thoughts and feelings that I often have that tend not to be so helpful in a sermon. For example, last week I talked about Christians who were offended by the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Through most of the week as I was writing that sermon, the general tone of the sermon was, I wasn't offended, and it's dumb that those people were offended most of the week. Toward the end of the week, my inner critic said to me, so, let me get this straight. The message is transforming our anger and our certainty into compassion and love. Great. So why do you still sound so angry and so certain of yourself? Right? Yikes. So I have to go back and consider how to be more reflective and understanding and curious about, like, everyone's human experience, not just my own. So, if God does speak in some way through me and through sermons, this is just a small glimpse into the journey that that message has to take in order to get here today. But that's not all, because each of you have lived your own week. So you're hearing 
will be influenced by your own experiences and your own struggles and your own emotions and your own relationships and your own distractions and your own random thoughts. So the message has to come to us through all of that. The message has to come to Daniel through all kinds of struggle. And the message comes to Daniel in verses 11 and verses 19, where Daniel hears, Daniel, you are loved. You are greatly loved. For such a simple message, it's hard to hear. For such a simple message, it's hard to understand and let sink in because it keeps getting delayed, at least for me, by all the noise of our world, by all the noise of politics, by all of the things happening in my own life. So God has to keep coming, fighting through all the noise to remind us that we are loved. The message keeps coming because it gets delayed. It gets twisted by those who say that you are loved if you believe this or behave in this way or look like this or think in this way or feel this way. The message keeps coming our entire lives. You are loved. You are greatly loved. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your love, your unconditional love for all of us. We pray that as we go through worship, that as we go through the rest of this day and through life, that we would continue to hear and to feel and experience again and again that we are enough, that we are loved. Amen.